So I'm going to read from a section of the book that's about the early days of the 111 West 57th Street project. Um, and it's set in Kevin Maloney of Property Market Group's office, which is quite close to here. Um, it's very brief. Um, it's set in 2013. Kevin Maloney was sitting in his company's New York office on West 17th Street when, as he tells it, he got a call from a broker friend. The broker said he was with a powerful client, the prince of some massive oil country, as he put it, who wanted to buy a stake in the new super tall that Maloney was building with Michael Stern on the Steinway site, which was now going by its official moniker, 111 West 57th. The prince, the broker said, was coming over to chat. New York has long been a draw for foreign leaders, even royalty to plunk down cash for choice properties, whether for second homes or simply as investments. Still, Maloney was skeptical. After years of dealing with phony condo buyers and time wasters, he was not easily convinced of anything. He had met with a dozen guys who claimed to be princes or billionaires, but he found out that they usually just turned out to be grifters. They come in, they tell you a story, you entertain them for a couple days, and when they have to write a check, they disappear, he said. There are people in the world that go around pretending to be something, actually engaging people in contracts and trying to buy stuff, but they don't actually have enough money for dinner, he said. <clears throat> Within a few hours, however, the so-called prince had arrived at Maloney's office in a motorcade of three shiny black Escalades with diplomatic or foreign plates. He was flanked by what Maloney described as two ex-military guys with tattoos up to their necks and holstered weapons on their belts and accompanied by an attorney. Inside Maloney's office, the visitor introduced himself to the developer offering a Middle Eastern sounding name that meant nothing to Maloney at the time. This guy has really got the show done, he thought to himself. <laughs> the prince looked nothing like one might have expected of a senior Saudi royal. There were no white robes or headdresses. He sat across the desk from Maloney in an ordinary streetwear outfit. With his flowing dark hair and ripped physique, he looked more like a trainer from a local gym than a man with billions of dollars at his fingertips. Only the armed guard standing by the door indicated that he was someone of any importance. He wasted no time getting to his ask, offering Maloney a deal that seemed to make absolutely no sense. He offered to pay him and his partners $250 million for a 50% stake in the Steinway project. To Maloney, an offer like that fell firmly into the category of way too good to be true. After all, the partners only had about $150 million invested so far, and the proposal being floated would allow them to make all their money back overnight, net a $100 million profit, and still keep a 50% stake in the project. To make it more absurd, the project hadn't even broken ground and didn't even have a construction loan. <coughs> Maloney nodded along, even though he was fairly certain this was a hoax. On the slim chance that the prince was legitimate, he would agree to bring the deal to his partners. As he rose to leave, the visitor asked Maloney one last question. He was looking for a place to stay when he came to New York and wondered if the developer knew of any great apartments. At the time, Maloney and Stern had two units remaining at Walker Tower the Art Deco former New York Telephone Company building, whose successful conversion into condos had supercharged their partnership. Maloney warned his visitor that the properties were extremely expensive, but he agreed to walk him the few blocks to have a look at them. The whole posse, about six men in all, walked down the street to the building, the guys with guns leading the way. When the prince strode into the five-bedroom penthouse at the top of Walker Tower, which boasted a private south-facing terrace and views of the Chrysler building. He only glanced at the kitchen and didn't so much as check out the bedrooms. How much, he asked, standing in the middle of the living room. 55 million, Kevin Maloney said. Will you take 51? <laughs> Maloney accepted, the two men shaking hands on the spot, though Maloney was confident the money would never materialize. As he walked the prince to his car, 
he noticed that a yellow boot had been applied to one of the escalades for failure to pay parking tickets. Maloney looked up at his visitor and smiled. This doesn't bode well, he thought. <laughs> the grift is up. Seeing the boot, the would-be royal gestured to his security guys to remove the license plates from the car. Then, as Maloney looked on in astonishment, the man and his entourage all piled into the other two escalades and drove off, leaving the third car behind. When Maloney got back to his office and googled the prince, he was shocked to be proved wrong. He was none other than Kadem al-Kubisi, the same top aide to the Abu Dhabi royal family who had led the financing of Gary Barnett's 157. As head of Abu Dhabi's International Petroleum Investment Company, he had been involved in negotiating the bailout of Barclays Bank in 2008 and had negotiated a multi-billion dollar investment in Daimler AG, the owner of Mercedes-Benz. Since then, he had also become a nightclub impresario. Among his many business ventures was his role as chair of a company called Hakkasan, which ran clubs in Las Vegas including the Omnia nightclub at Caesars Palace, famous for its UFO-style chandelier suspended over the dance floor. <clears throat> the company was known for luring top DJs like Calvin Harris and Tiesto, who would sign exclusive contracts to play at the clubs. Only then did it occur to Maloney that this guy might be legitimate. Shortly after his brief visit to the penthouse, Al Kabisi wired a $15 million deposit for the penthouse. The impulse deal would break the record for a Manhattan condo south of 34th Street, and the story would become legend among the Walker Tower partners, with Stern's recollection varying significantly from Maloney's. In Maloney's version, the abandoned Escalade was still sitting on the street near his office weeks later, covered in a mess of tickets. At some point, the mirrors were picked off. 